This is Epicenter, episode 358 with guest Camilla Russo. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, I'd like you to pick up your phone, your iPad, or your Mac right now and go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple so you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It's the easiest free way to support us. And it really helps people find the show and establish Epicenter as the leading technical podcast in the crypto space. And I'll tell you a secret, I also love reading them. Today, our guest is Camilla Russo. She's an author, a journalist, and the founder of The Defiant, a newsletter and podcast about the DeFi space. She recently wrote a book called The Infinite Machine, which tells the story of Ethereum from the very beginning to today. And it's a fascinating read. I had pre-ordered this book many months ago, totally forgot about it, and then I received it while I was on vacation, and I read it as soon as I got back. I really love this book uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, One, it's an accurate account of the entire history of Ethereum from the very beginning to today through, you know, the white paper, the early days of Ethereum, Vitalik going out and finding co-founders, to the crowd sale, to the ICO boom, and all the stories that happen in between. And the other reason I really like this book is because it's, if you've been in the space long enough, it's such a trip down memory lane, like reminding you of like a simpler time in the blockchain space to some extent. So if you hadn't read it, go out and buy it and you'll blow through it in like a day or two. She's also the co-founder of The Defiant, which is a newsletter and podcast about the DeFi space. She puts out the newsletter every day, which is really impressive. Not that there's an absence of content to talk about in DeFi, but you know it is a feat to be able to write a newsletter every day. So we talked about the book, obviously, and the process of writing the book, which was also really fascinating. And we had a conversation about DeFi, and we looked at what's happening in the DeFi space at the moment, all of this exuberance that we see and discussed whether or not we think there's actual value being created here and what the prospects might be for the future. Since we're on the topic of DeFi, I'd like to mention Algorand and the platform that they provide that is purpose-built for DeFi. In fact, all the primitives that you need to build sophisticated DeFi applications are built right into the Layer 1 protocol. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on during the interview, but for now, here's my conversation with Camilla Russo. So I'm here with Camilla Russo who is an author now, but a writer and uh, the founder of The Defiant, which is a newsletter, a podcast, a YouTube channel about DeFi. She's very present on Twitter as well and very present also at Ethereum and crypto conferences. So thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. I just finished reading your book a couple of days ago. I thought it was great. Like It was like a really interesting and kind of fun read you know, for uh, since I've been in the space, I was around the time that Ethereum was launching and everything. So it was like cool to go back and, you know, think back about those times. And it was just like a nice walk through memory lane, I guess, in a lot of ways. So that's kind of fun. But we'll talk a bit more about the book during our conversation here. But first, I, let's talk a little bit about you and share with our listeners a bit about your background, where you came from and how you got to where you are today. My background is obviously in journalism before going full-time the defiant and you know writing the infinite machine i was at bloomberg for eight years covering markets so you know i started um with an internship in new york with bloomberg then they sent me to uh, the buenos aires office to cover argentine markets i mostly focused on the currency and debt then i spent there Uh, like four and a half years in Argentina. Then I asked to move to Madrid where I covered European stocks, which wasn't so exciting after covering the crazy Argentine market. So I took the chance to move back to New York when they opened this new team called Markets Live, which covered like macro markets real time. You know, that's really when I started to cover crypto day to day. I had written about Bitcoin before in Argentina 
in 2013. That's where I wrote kind of my first story on Bitcoin and when, when I became interested in crypto. But, you know, I was in New York in 2017 covering markets. And so, you know, I had kind of remained interested in crypto since I first wrote about it in 2013. So I took the chance to really, you know, start focusing on crypto with the boom. There was just like insatiable appetite for Bitcoin stories from Bloomberg readers. So that's kind of how I got into the space. And then end of 2017, I decided I wanted to write a book on the history of Ethereum. Then early 2018, I got the deal with HarperCollins and just started kind of focusing on writing the book almost full time. And yeah, then 2019, I, I left Bloomberg to finish the book and also because I wanted to be more independent. And then June 2019, I founded The Defiant. So yeah, that's where, where I am. Let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned you're from Argentina and that you started covering Bitcoin in, I guess, 2013, so quite early. What kind of activity were you noticing back then in Argentina in terms of Bitcoin use? And how has that evolved in your view since then? Just one small clarification. I'm actually from Chile, from Santiago. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. But yeah, so I was uh, covering markets with Bloomberg in Argentina. You know, the reason why I pitched this story on Bitcoin when I was mostly, you know, writing about Argentine bonds and FX was because like a, a big part of, of what I was doing was like the big story was inflation in Argentina. Like there was 25% inflation and the currency controls, which, you know, this was Cristina Fernandez's second term and like two days into or like a few days into her into her term she decided to like ban all dollar purchases so that was kind of like a, a big ongoing story and so I was covering you know the different ways that Argentines had to protect against inflation and currency controls and so that's how I got to Bitcoin like a colleague said hey like check out this like weird digital currency that's gaining steam in Argentina I saw there was like a, a Bitcoin meetup with like over 100 people uh, going. And so I said, OK, so this is like a real thing. I spoke with, you know, some of the people leading exchanges there, you know, just some like Bitcoin holders in Argentina and asked them why they got into Bitcoin in, in the first place. And, you know, it just like really opened my eyes that there was this possibility of having a completely independent uh, money that didn't rely on central banks and financial institutions and couldn't be influenced by governments. And there's like this active kind of Argentine community within crypto. And it's because they, it's very easy to understand the value proposition of cryptocurrencies when you've been living through that kind of economic mismanagement with your local currency all your life. I lived through that as well. Like I was um, earning my salary in Argentine pesos. So as soon as I got to Argentina, like the first thing I was told by my Bloomberg colleagues was when you get your salary, you need to exchange it for dollars or else you're, you're going to lose money. And so I was doing that. And then, you know, just dealing with all the, the hassle of, of having to kind of, you had to like pay your rent in dollars because property owners weren't taking pesos and it was just like all like a big hassle to be living with that high inflation. I went through kind of that, that same process of like discovering Bitcoin and, and just like getting it right away. And I reported for this particular story and it was like hard to convince my editors to actually take it. Like it was like really early for Bitcoin and Bloomberg was like not really covering it. And so half of my editors didn't really understand what it was. The ones who had heard about it really thought it was like some sort of scam. Like, so it, it took like effort to convince them to actually take this story. In this context of, you know, hyperinflation, and you mentioned that at some point it became illegal in Argentina to convert pesos into dollars. Even in this context, it was hard for you to convince your editors to write about this alternative currency that would allow people to 
essentially have more freedom with what they could do with their money? Yeah, because you have to kind of like put yourself in the shoes of a Bloomberg editor. They're like sitting in New York. The readers are like from very obviously like traditional markets. They're not investing in crypto. And so they're obviously serving those readers who they'll understand buying dollar bonds from an Argentine investor's perspective or, you know, buying some sort of Argentine stocks or something to protect their savings. But that's kind of as far as they would go, like they to venture outside of like the traditional assets and, and consider that this like really new currency that's not backed by anything other than its own system that could be kind of a, a, a legitimate viable investing alternative was like really hard for them to understand. Even outside of our, you know, of Argentina or places with you know, high inflation, it was hard. I mean, even I'm here in France and I remember, you know, for years and even now, I mean, I had lunch with someone yesterday who is still with whom, you know, I had to explain what crypto was. And this is in 2020. It's hard sometimes to kind of like think back to those times and how difficult it was to explain these concepts to people. Like it was just so novel. Like I said, I think it's easier when you're in Argentina and you can understand how hard it is to deal with inflation. And it's a little bit kind of, mind-blowing that somebody can tell you what you can and can't do with your money. I don't know, if, if I hadn't lived through that, it, I think it, I would have like a hard time understanding it as well. But it's, it's not like some like abstract concept because it's like, it's something that people are, were already doing, like a, a normal average person was already taking whatever they could save and buying dollars with that. Like it's something that every Ar Argentine does. And so for, for the government to one day just say, you can't do that anymore, and the options are literally gone. You had the option in your online bank account one day to take your pesos from your local account to your foreign currency account and buy dollars just like online. And that like from one day to the next was just simply not there. And if you went to a bank and said, I want to buy dollars, they just like wouldn't sell them to you. It's really mind-blowing. If you're sitting in the U.S. and you've never had an issue with your bank, you never had kind of this crisis where the bank tells you, no, your deposits are locked in, or you never had double-digit inflation, you never had currency controls, like you have, you trust your government, you trust your financial institutions, it's even harder to understand why cryptocurrencies matter. So, and at Bloomberg, I was like dealing with people who... You know, they're like bread and butter is covering the traditional market. So it was just like even harder. When you moved to the U.S., then you were covering crypto there in the U.S. as well. What was the reception there? Of course, you know, it had been some time had passed, like crypto had gotten more into, I guess, like, you know, people's minds. What were your editors views on crypto and how is it being covered? By that time, it was completely different. So I was in the Markets Live team, which, like I said, it's like a live blog of like running market commentary. And we were a small team and like people in the team had freedom to write about whatever seemed interesting. So I started to write posts on Bitcoin and there was like talk about a Bitcoin ETF at the time. So I was writing about that, about like ICOs and my kind of the, the managing editor for like markets noticed that I was interested in crypto. And at the same time, there was like rising demand for stories on, on Bitcoin and crypto. So this time it was the other way around. Like my editors came to me asking for more crypto coverage. So that was um, a big change. Like it, it was, I think, a reflection of Bitcoin becoming more recognized, like more accepted as like an actual investment and you know just like recognize that it's not a scam like it's a an actual legitimate thing which some editors might be more skeptical than others but in, in the end like they saw the value of, of covering it so that was a big change from 2013 so they they came up to me and and asked me to you know help with crypto coverage on just like the wider Bloomberg news, not, not just for the blog. So I started, I divided my days with like, I, I need to have at least two posts for Markets Live in the morning. And then the afternoon was just 
to write about crypto. So I had kind of those two jobs. When did you first hear about Ethereum? In 2017, covering crypto for Bloomberg. The first time was when I wrote kind of one of the first stories on ICOs for Bloomberg. And I remember just like trying to wrap my head around what these things were. It's like Bitcoin, but it's different digital currencies and uh, anyone can issue them. And they're on top of this other blockchain called Ethereum. And, you know, I was coming at crypto coverage from like um, a market perspective. So I didn't have like a lot of technical knowledge about how blockchains work or crypto works or anything. I, I understood kind of the value proposition of Bitcoin from having it covered like in Argentina back then, but that was my extent of knowledge about it. So it was like writing that first ICO story was, I think, when I, I started looking at Ethereum for the first time. And then just like, as I kept covering the space uh, for the rest of 2017, I started to learn more and more ab about it and understood, okay, Ethereum is a blockchain like Bitcoin, but why it's valuable, it's because it's, it tries to be more flexible than, than Bitcoin. And that's why it's easier for people to issue all these different tokens on top of it. And so, you know, that's kind of seeing all of this kind of frenzy around ICOs and these tokens and this like millions of dollars pouring in. I was like, there's something here, you know, um, this kind of decentralized way of, of raising money. And Ethereum is kind of the platform enabling this. Back in January, we interviewed Steve Kokinos and Sylvia McCallie of Algorand. And during our conversation, we talked about how Algorand's unique design makes it easy for developers to build sophisticated applications on their platform. So what's great about Algorand, beyond the fact that it's fast, it's secure, it scales, and it has instant finality, is the fact that they've designed a layer one protocol with primitives that are purpose-built for DeFi. So what that means is that they've taken some of the most common things that people do with smart contracts and they've embedded them right in the system, right in the layer one. So things like issuing tokens, atomic transfers, well, these are built into the layer one and smart contracts are first class citizens on Algorand. So with these essential building blocks at your disposal, you can build fast and secure DeFi apps in no time. To learn more about what Algorand brings to the table and how to get started, I would encourage you to check out algorand.com epicenter. That lets them know that you heard about it from us and it takes you where you need to go to learn about their tech. And with that, we'd like to thank Algorand for supporting the podcast. What point do you, does one say, I'm going to write a book about something? Like, that's never something that's ever crossed my mind, or I think a lot of people's minds. What point do you, do you decide to write a book? And then what is the process? I mean, forget about the process of writing the book, but like, what's the process of figuring out what kind of book you want to write? Because you, you could have written this book and you know, all, I mean, it's very kind of, you know, descriptive account of what happens. It's mostly in, in the third person. You could have written a fiction, uh, you know, you could have written a firsthand account of your interviews. What was the process for the creative process, I guess, of like figuring out the kind of book you wanted to write? For background, I always wanted to, to write a book. Like that's been kind of a goal of mine forever. I got into journalism because I like writing. I guess like growing up, one of my favorite books was In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. And I think, you know, that was the first time I realized, wow, you, you can write about real life, like nonfiction in a way that reads like a novel. And that idea to me was really powerful because going into journalism and especially business journalism, which is usually so dry, I found that, okay, Stories can make these very kind of complex, dry concepts come alive if you tell them in the right way. And so getting the, the example from uh, Truman Capote and then especially Michael Lewis, I saw, okay, wow, like this is a really powerful way of speaking about nonfiction. And obviously I love fiction. It's, it's what I personally read the most. But I just thought, you know, if I was ever to write a book, I would want to provide like value to readers by bringing something from the real world and making it colorful and read like a story because I just thought, you know, there's like so many interesting stories in the real world, you know, that need to be highlighted. So like, why should I 
like go and invent another story from my own imagination when there's already so much to tell in real life. At some point, I guess like, I think it was probably when you get into the Bloomberg internship, they give you like a list of recommended readings. And I mean, one of them was Michael Lewis books. I think it was Liar's Poker. And so when I read that book, I was like, okay, like I need to find a story that I can pick up and tell like Michael Lewis does for his books. So I was like always on the lookout for that. Like what can be a story that I can tell in this way, like in a something I can make into a nonfiction novel. And I think with crypto it was kind of the first time that I thought, okay, this is it. Like this is where I need to find my story to tell. Sorry, I, I meant to say, when I said fiction earlier, I meant to say like a dramatized version of it, like something a little bit more like, um, of course, you could make a fiction of, of the story of Ethereum, but like a, something akin to the Bitcoin Billionaire's book, right, where it's like this kind of more dramatized version of the facts. But like the way you wrote the book is like this very kind of factual account that it reads like a novel. It, it does read like a story, but it's like this very factual thing based on your interviews, based on your conversations. When you're reading it, you really get the idea, like, this is how things happen. This is exactly what happened. Yeah. I love Bitcoin Billionaires, but, you know, reading kind of the foreword where the author says, you know, some of these things were fictionalized. There's always like that kind of question in the back of my mind as I was reading the book, like, okay, Did this what part conversation of this is actually happen? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's like, I don't love that, to be honest. Like, I love the book, but I, I think it's just a personal preference that I wanted everything in my book to be as factually accurate as possible. I don't want to make this interview entirely about the book, but like, I'm just curious about the creative process that goes into writing a book like this. And there are passages in the book where, of course, there's conversations, right? You're citing people, you're citing conversation, you're citing Skype exchanges or things like that. And so she interviewed this person and this person gave her the account. But like, how does he really remember exactly what he said? Well, then there must be some kind of like, you know, this is the account of what that person said that they thought they said at the time. I mean, so it, it might be a little bit stretched, but it like... Generally, it's sort of like an account of what happened based on people's stories, right? Definitely, yeah. As accurate as possible. And I think kind of the way to make sure I'm not straying too far from, from reality is just to verify, to make sure I'm not using just one person's version, for example, a conversation. So getting both uh, like everyone's accounts that, who were involved and just like contrasting that. And the process involved many interviews and just making sure that uh, everyone involved in a situation or, or conversation was interviewed and I got their side. So in that way, I could kind of reconstruct uh, what happened. One thing that's interesting about this and like you came in to the space or like I guess you, you came into to Ethereum a little bit later, so like around 2017, you said, and you've now become like this personality in the community. Like you have your podcast, you have your newsletter, you get this YouTube channel, you speak at all these conferences. It reminds me of Neil Strauss and like what he went through when he wrote the game. So like he went into this kind of wanting to understand this community of like pickup artists. And then by doing so, he himself became a pickup artist and like well-known for this thing. And like you went into this wanting to write a book about Ethereum and then you became like this kind of personality within Ethereum itself. And like, obviously like more of a journalist in this space. Did you anticipate that by writing this book, you would kind of like become this personality and like go out and build the defiant and be uh, like a voice in the community? Or was that something intentional? No, I could have never anticipated anything of <laughs> what happened later. With this book, the reason for writing it first and foremost was kind of achieving this lifelong goal that I had of reading a writing a nonfiction novel. And then my plan was to, after writing the book, to just like continue doing journalism. Like I thought, you know, this book will be great in kind of, I don't know, like cementing, I guess, my journalism skills. Uh, my writing skills, like just adding to my like profile or whatever, just as a journalist, right? And as a writer, not, not like as someone in Ethereum. And my original plan was once I finished this book, I would go and freelance. And, you know, my, what I wanted to do was just write more kind of magazine type stories and 
start writing like tech and like finance uh, features for different magazines and then like see what I, I wanted to do. I mean, I always had wanted to like start my own media company or just like my own venture at some point. So that was like still in the back of my mind. But my original plan when I left Bloomberg was finish this book and then freelance and freelance in like general tech and finance, like not specifically on Ethereum. So it wasn't part, part of the plan, but I think, you know, as I was researching and like, I was like in the Ethereum community at all these hackathons and conferences and just talking to people, I, I really saw this like DeFi ecosystem kind of blossom. And for me, it was just fascinating what was being built. And it just seemed like a huge opportunity to cover because nobody was doing a great job at it, I thought. So I just saw that opportunity and I was really fascinated by what was going on. So I would have covered it, you know, anyways, but I also just like always wanted to have my, my own thing as well. So I thought, you know, I'll start with a newsletter and see how that happened. Let's get into the nitty gritty here. So give us some juicy anecdotes. <laughs> like what are some kind of interesting stories that happened on the sidelines that you, you, know, you could share that, you know, aren't covered in the book, but are like kind of like meta things that may have happened or one story that I had to cut from the book was, you know, th that I think is really interesting, but it just like, I had so many characters that my editor was just like, I'm getting lost with all this. Like you need to cut some people out. I had like in the ICO part of the book, I had Peter McCormick's story. What's the story? So his story is that he got into the space because he, he started trading tokens. And it's, it's funny because now he comes off as this like big, like Bitcoin maximalist, but he came into the space kind of trading Ethereum tokens and, and, you know, obviously Bitcoin, but just like riding this ICO boom. And I don't remember how much money he actually had at the top, but it was a large amount, like, I don't know, say a million dollars or don't quote me on that. But he started out with a relatively... I think I've heard the story before where also like where he had quite a bit and then lost quite a bit. Yeah, he refused to sell and then just like lost it all. And in that process, you know, he started because in the beginning he was just like trading coins and, and not really learning about crypto or anything. But in the process of like the crash, he started to actually learn and understand more about Bitcoin and and his family and friends were always like asking him to teach them what was going on. And that's how he initially started. I think it was in, initially a newsletter and then then became a, a podcast and so that's how he started his business and now obviously like his main business is his kind of communications media company and so i think you know it's it's a fascinating story of you know going earning all this money or, or getting all this money from tokens losing it all but then just like still being able to build an actual business out of it that was like one interesting story that i i was like really sad to cut and had to kind of leave in the editing <laughs> room. Are there any other uh, stories that you had to leave out? There are so many people involved in, in Ethereum. I mentioned a, a lot of them in the book and, you know, there were, you know, names I had to cut out, but that was just like a big piece of the book that I, like a chunk of it that I had to cut out. Another anecdote is um, my interview with Joe Lubin. The first interview I had with him was really weird. Like it was really hard for me to get him talking. I know what you mean. Having interviewed Joe a couple of times and, you know, he's great and everything. I, I love talking with Joe, but like, he's a bit hard to read sometimes. That's for sure. Yeah. It was so tough. And, and I was just like, so intimidated by it because all the, the interviews or like most of them were like super easy, like conversations flowed. And I always began the interview by just like asking the person to go back and just like, tell me basically their life story. Like I was you know, really looking to learn about the person, not just what they did on Ethereum, but just like understand them and be able to kind of convey their personality and kind of their backstory. So all the interviews started in this way, you know, just like tell me about your childhood, like your, how you were brought up, your family, like all of that. And Joe, I think it was like the wrong approach with him uh, because he's a lot, like more private person. So he just like closed up. At the beginning of the interview, he's just like, why are you asking me this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I could see how that that might go a bit awry. Yeah, I mean that's one of the things I, I liked about the book is like there's so many people in crypto. Like we know so many of them. We see them on Twitter. We meet them at conferences, etc. But I think one of the most fascinating things about the people in crypto are their background stories, so like, because there's just so many fascinating ones. And one of the things I've loved about doing this podcast is like asking that question we usually ask at the beginning, which is how did you get involved in this? And you know, a lot of times people have similar backgrounds, but there's sometimes where there's like these little nuggets of people that how did you end up here? And that was one of the things about the book that I really like too, is getting to learn about some of the background stories of people that I, for whom I didn't really have the background story. Like I said at the beginning, like I thought it was a really great read. You know, I wasn't like in the weeds of Ethereum from the beginning, but I was following it, you know, pretty closely and, you know, hanging out at the Berlin office once in a while and, you know, like getting to meet some of the people early on. I felt like I kind of knew this, like as I was reading the story, like, oh yeah, I remember that. I remember this. Like, and there wasn't anything that was particularly kind of surprising. I would have wished that you would have went more into the kind of like the juicy details or like some of the background stuff that like people didn't really know about or may, you know, you may have been revealed. Is this something that was intentional or are you trying to like protect people or were you kind of mindful of like not disclosing too much or? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I definitely tried to my best to get like all the main parts of the Ethereum story and uncover as much as possible. And I think maybe, you know, if, if you're obviously like in Ethereum and, and like involved in it, maybe a lot of this stuff isn't, isn't surprising. But, you know, I, I, I would hope for, for most people in crypto that weren't as involved in, in Ethereum, they, they didn't really know like all the, all the backstory. But, you know, about kind of the more like juicy, like backstories and, and stuff like that. Like I said, like I, I really followed really the like Bloomberg standards with this story. So if there was like some like sort of gossip that I, I heard from, from one person and they didn't want to go on the record and like nobody else would verify on the record or like somebody would kind of hint that that was the case, but not really provide any evidence, I, I wouldn't include it. Yeah, I, you I wrote just a book wanted... as a journalist. <laughs> yes, yes. There you go. Let's see. Yeah, I, I really <laughs> wanted it to to be kind of like airtight, you know, like that nobody could come at it and be like, this is wrong. Like what, you know, like my 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 biggest fear was that somebody would just like take down the book and like and ruin it because like they had some issue with, if anybody has an issue with the book, I want to be able to kind of defend it and be like, here are five on the record interviews that I did backing this up. Like the, here is the, the documentation backing this up. So I guess like that's why maybe you didn't have like all the gossipy stuff. <laughs> One part that was like totally new to me was the whole part about the house. And like, I, I didn't know about any of that. Like what, I mean, I, I kind of knew that there was a house at some point, but like, I didn't know who was there. And uh, You mean in Switzerland? The house in Zurich. Yeah. Let's. Uh, switch gears a little bit and, and talk a little bit about Ethereum and DeFi. Uh, of course, it's a very, you know, hot topic at the moment, I guess one could say. <laughs> yeah. You know, how would you describe the arc of the Ethereum narrative and how that's changed over time? And what is the current Ethereum narrative? You know, if there is kind of like a canonical narrative. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think the narrative... Of Ethereum, like I guess when it first launched, it was meant to be the narrative was like world computer, right? Kind of this extremely flexible platform for developers to build whatever they dreamed of, and that included like all the crazy applications. It was like name an application, put blockchain on it, and this is what we're building on Ethereum. So it was it was just like full of crazy ideas. Then, you know, 2016 was more about, obviously, the DAO and, and just, like, decentralized organizations, and the narrative was more uh, kind of focused on that. And then, I guess, like, in 2017, it was ICOs and just, like, this decentralized way of raising money through tokens that, you know, would later be added to these different applications and platforms mostly as a kind of like payment currency within the platform. And then kind of that narrative got, or like ICOs got a really bad name because 
not many of them delivered. Obviously, like many were scams and regulators came in and then there was this market crash and people lost money. So nobody wanted to have anything to do with tokens and ICOs. Then I think, you know, 2019, the narrative started, you know, went from Ethereum in the bear market, which from the outside just looked like a barren land. Um, you know, like there wasn't a lot going on, at least like on the surface. If you went to like hackathons, you would see there were more like builders and activity than, than ever. But like around DevCon 4, like that kind of time. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, there was like a new narrative starting to rise from kind of the ashes, which was decentralized finance. And I think that's been the narrative so far. And it's kind of um evolution of ICOs. I think ICOs were maybe the the first iteration of DeFi because, you know, raising money is still um, a financial application. But now instead of having just like one uh, financial application or financial service being built on Ethereum, you have a whole kind of ecosystem of financial applications. So I think that's kind of the main narrative now. Um, and the, Obviously, there are other sectors being developed on Ethereum, games, reputation, I guess, like identity, you know, other things, not, not just finance. But I think finance has, you know, definitely kind of taken the, the majority of attention and, and not just attention, but also usage of Ethereum. If, if you look at kind of applications and tokens, coins, taking up the most gas and transactions, they are related to DeFi. There's also a, a bunch of like scams in the top gas users, but you know. So, so yeah, I, I think you can definitely kind of say that DeFi is the, the main narrative on, on Ethereum right now. Yeah. When, when you spoke with all the people that you interviewed for the book, and yeah, I'm, I'm thinking specifically, I'm more specifically, I guess, of like, the people who were there at the beginning, the co-founders, like the early team and everything. What was your impression of their impression, I guess, of how things had gone? Like, did you get a feeling that they were okay with where Ethereum had landed, which is now this kind of crazy DeFi space, like this kind of degenerate farming, as people call it? Were there any regrets or, or is like everything kind of fine and this is the way things should be? Like what, what was your sense of the, the general yeah, impressions about where things had taken us? When I spoke with the kind of early co-founders, I spoke with them in like 2018, early 2019, maybe. Like DeFi really hadn't taken off when I did those interviews. And, you know, this like degen <laughs> variation of DeFi is even like more recent. So, you know, I, I, I wasn't like all this stuff hadn't happened yet. So I, you know, I, I wasn't able to get their, their opinions on all that. But like in general, I think, you know, their, their views on Ethereum, you know, thinking about kind of what Charles said, what Anthony said, what Gavin said, Vitalik you know, they, they were all like hugely proud to have been part of the project of like the early kind of founding team. Um, you know, even, you know, Charles and Gavin, who went off to, to do, to uh, build their own blockchains, they, they were all like very proud of what Ethereum had become. I think, you know, at that time, Anthony was a little bit kind of um, disappointed of you know, it was like I interviewed him in the middle of the bear market. He he was kind of investing in all these other tokens and like layer ones or, or, or looking at them. So obviously he was he was very proud to have been part of the founding team. But I got a sense from him that he would have wanted more for Ethereum. But then I I, I talked to him recently for um, a consensus event uh, conference. And he was like, now I'm like more bullish than ever. <laughs> so he, he came around. So yeah, I, I think, you know, for, for everyone, it, it was like, yeah, an, an amazing project to, to be a part of. And everyone was kind of happy with how things had, had turned 
out for for Ethereum, but like for for Gavin and and Charles, they they were kind of yeah happy to see how how far Ethereum had come uh, since the, the the early days, but they're also kind of trying to do something better at, at the same time. Mm. I'm I'm curious what you know being so connected in in, in DeFi and like reporting on DeFi. What do you make of what's happening in the space, and is it something that coming from you know having reported what's what was going on in Argentina and and covering sort of the excesses of global finance? Do you think that yeah, like what's your position on the DeFi space and the exuberance that's happening in DeFi right now? So, I think you know what's happening in in the DeFi space to me is is really encouraging to see that there is an alternative financial system being built with using these um, decentralized networks, uh, taking out intermediaries. Uh, I think it's really amazing that these uh, protocols are not disrupting yet, but like laying kind of the foundations to to disrupt or, or to try to replace uh, at least for some people traditional financial services there, there was a column by uh, ian lee from ido in, in the defiant yesterday which really laid it out really clearly and said bitcoin and ethereum allowed kind of the finances base layer to upgrade because we've been using kind of the the same infrastructure for decades and like centuries even like money's been transacted in kind of the same way for years and years and it's hugely inefficient like it's we're using networks that are not meant to to carry value and now with 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 blockchains uh, public blockchains we we can have this kind of global network for money and so bitcoin and ethereum were able to upgrade the like base layer infrastructure of money but now with DeFi, we're getting to kind of the application layer of financial services and you know having a more more open more transparent financial services than than we have today so it's obviously very early days and and there will be huge kind of improvements and a big evolution from where we are today but it's two years old and i think the progress so far has been amazing. I mean, we have ways to uh, exchange and, and swap tokens in a decentralized way. We have ways to lend and de- deposit assets and gain passive interest, ways to take out uh, collateralized loans in a permissionless way, and all these more kind of exotic use cases like you know, this like no loss lottery and like yield hopping and all this, you know, more crazy things that you couldn't even do with traditional finance. So I, I think that's amazing. Um, it's hugely encouraging. I think, you know, with the recent speculation um, with yield farming and like all the meme tokens, I think that's kind of the nature of the space, which is open and permissionless. And so you know, people will experiment and will try crazy things. People will try to take advantage of others. Like humans are motivated by greed, I guess, making money. And that's what they'll do. And it's because this space is open and permissionless that this is happening. I think, you know, hopefully people involved in DeFi so far are more or less, I would think, more experience in in dealing with cryptocurrencies like i don't i don't think just like mainstream people are getting into yield farming right now i think the space is is still small and still very niche um that you don't see kind of like you know kind of this cliche of like the shoe shining person or taxi driver talking about DeFi, and that's a good thing because it's so risky right now so i think hopefully people risking their money in these unedited crazy uh, yield farming experiments and know the risk that they're taking. And if if they do and, and they know the risk and, and they just, you know, it's their money to do what they want. So I, I wouldn't like judge all the degen farmers for experimenting. And I think 
In the end, what we saw with ICOs is there was a huge inflow of capital and also talent to Ethereum. And you know, some people left when, when the bear market came, but uh, many people stayed. And a lot of the big projects in, in DeFi and Ethereum today came out of that boom. So, you know, if we happen to have like this huge DeFi fueled bubble, I believe that it will be a, a net positive for, for Ethereum and, and for decentralized finance in the long run as well. I mean, I have different points of view about this and, you know, I think you kind of sum a lot of them up, but you know, my, my position is that I'm fascinated by the experimentation that's happening in DeFi. I'm fascinated by the sort of permissionless nature and these new financial instruments that people are just like coming up with out of thin air. I think like liquidity pools and all these things are super interesting and like the yield farming and all that stuff. I mean, at, at some point it gets, you know, even for someone who's, you know, in crypto, it even gets complex, right? And like, it's really hard to grasp, but it's nonetheless interesting. And it's like a, an interesting technical and philosophical thought experiment to think about this stuff. And I love that part of it. When I think about the actual tangible things that are happening, though, I question the actual value that exists in DeFi. And so, like, however you wanna you wanna count it, like those, you know, about like take Ethereum and DeFi combined is about fifty billion in market cap today, or something like that. You know how how much of this is overpriced in terms of like the actual value created. And you could say the same about Bitcoin. You could say the same about like other cryptocurrencies. But like since we're talking about Ethereum and since like Ethereum is kind of the place where everyone's kind of investing their money right now and there's lots of speculation happening, you know, that's the one that I'm mostly concerned about. And in the best case scenario, you know, Ethereum and, and crypto does take over a lot of the financial infrastructure that exists today. You know, if you if you listen to guys like Jim Bianco, uh, you know, they'll say that you know it, it's possible that, you know, in the future we have a crypto reserve currency and that would be great. Right. Like, I mean, I think that would be great. But in the worst case scenario, what ends up happening is that we have all these very financial instruments that are even more complex than the ones that exist today and that are reserved to a very small elite of people that are able to understand them and manipulate them and create them. And we end up with, you know, even more inequality than that exists today. And, you know, that's maybe very far out, you know, this would be like a hundred or you know, 50 or a hundred year prospect, but um, like the um, totally uninhibited free market, I think, you know, probably would produce something similar to what I described, like this, this kind of very dystopian future. And yeah, I, I I do worry about that, and and when I see what's happening in DeFi, like I I do question sort of the value that that is actually being created, and you know I think Vitalik was kind of you know Vitalik when when he kind of called this out you know in during the ICO boom I thought it was it was very um, noble of him to call it out and say like okay how many unbanked people have we unbanked or have we banked and do we deserve all this all this value you know yeah. I don't know what what the point of that is, but <laughs> I Not guess it's, it's just uh, just to kind of you know take pause sometimes and, and to to really think about what it is that we're creating and what what do we want to create. And I think like most people in, in the Ethereum community are well intentioned people and like perfectly you know smart people, uh, but you know the when one is creating a tool or a new financial instrument should also consider you know this kind of human aspect, right? Like what were people going to be using this for, and what's what's the point of this, right? The difference that I see with ICOs is that there is actual value being created. Like it's not just like tokens flying around, going from one bag to the next. Um, like there are actual working products and project protocols be behind underlying these tokens. You know, take something like compound finance, which on one side, yes, there is speculation and people are taking collateralized loans to borrow crypto, to buy more crypto and, and speculate. But the other side of that trade is people depositing their, you know, part of their savings to earn passive income, like passive interest. And I think, you know, financial systems across the spectrum work because of speculators on one, on one hand and, and non-speculators on the other hand. Like you need speculators to create 
activity and, and liquidity and to allow kind of this uh, fluid transfer of, of value. Um, and on the other hand, there are non-speculative uh, use cases and that's happening in, in DeFi as well. I think it's hugely valuable to be able to, for anyone in the world to be able to have a, a dollar-based savings account gaining interest um, from people in Argentina, like I said, who simply cannot buy dollars to be able to freely buy die and put it in compound or buy C die and start gaining interest on that, on their savings. People in Venezuela, the same. And not just people in emerging economies, but people in, in developed countries where, you know, interest rates are zero or negative and you have to pay the bank to store your money. Uh, they can also see use from, from this. So I think, you know, there's definitely speculation, but there's real, real value being created. And I think, you know, it would be hard to create a more unequal financial system than what we have today with, with DeFi, just because of how it's structured. I think, you know, the, the current financial system, one, is fragmented in geographies, like each country has its own financial system and it's closed off to the rest. So you already have like, because of its very architecture, you have like casts of financial systems where you have like the developed nations, the US is its own kind of economy and people from outside can't really access those markets in like DeFi or like an open economy. It's a global financial system that anyone can access. And the fact that it's permissionless, like you don't need to ask anyone to, to use these applications. So I think just like by their very architecture, they should create a less unequal financial system. And, and I really, you know, I see it that I see that it would be very hard to, to have something worse than, than what we have today with traditional finance. Obviously, it, it won't be perfect. Like there will be whales, people controlling large amounts of tokens and, you know, having more control over protocols and, you know, using it to vote in their way. And we'll have all those problems. Um, but it would still be a lot better than what we have today. Like right now, yeah, like there are like governance whales in, uh, in compound. But right now, like you can't even have that option with the bank you use. Like you cannot participate in governance. It doesn't matter if you're a whale or not, you know. So I, I think, you know, I, I, I really am encouraged with where this is going. Even if there is speculation, <laughs> I do see actual value. I, I certainly hope so. So after the ICO boom, you know, we meant we talked a little bit about this earlier. You know, regulators kind of came in and started clamping down the ICOs, and and you know that now ICOs are, are much more structured, like security tokens or as utility tokens. And you know, there's like some regulatory arbitrage going on there, but at least in Europe, like it's pretty clear cut, like what is a security token offering and what is not. And I think also in the U.S., do you sometimes worry that? You know, the, the exuberance that's happening in the DeFi space at the moment might, you know, tip off regulators to to what's happening in, in DeFi and they might see it as, you know, this is very kind of dangerous speculative environment and, and start heavily regulating what people can do in DeFi, regulating, say, things like stable coins, uh, making them illegal, for example. What are your thoughts on like the risks that this exuberance might be the demise of, of DeFi? I think that that is a really kind of valid concern to have because effectively, you know, regulation is what killed ICOs. And I think, you know, right now DeFi is small enough that maybe it hasn't kind of caught uh, regulators' eye. And also, the, the, I don't think a lot of like mainstream people are, are involved. So not, not, there's not a lot of risk of just like knowledgeable people in, in crypto losing money. Uh, so that's kind of protected this space a little bit, but I think it's only a matter of time really for regulators to really, you know, start watching the space. I think, you know, th there is certainly a risk that regulatory action could dampen activity in DeFi. I think, you know, steps that teams in DeFi are taking to decentralize themselves um, as much as possible might protect them somewhat, but I'm, I'm skeptical that it's kind of the, the kind of, you know, like 
perfect solution to to like regulatory risk. I, I think it, it can help, you know, to have a decentralized organization and and like token holders controlling a protocol because in the end if you want to go after someone like how do you decide who you should go after uh so i think you know may maybe that does offer some protection but in the end you know i think regulators can't say transacting in stable coins is, is illegal right and then what do you do like maybe and and you know as we've seen the way that uh, regulators work is dealing with kind of the the bridges from crypto to the real world so they so maybe you can kind of continue using defi but you can never really cash out or you 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 can't kind of transfer that to us dollars or your local currency so i, I think those are kind of the, the 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 ways that regulators can come in but the other kind of argument that i've heard from like lawyers in, in DeFi is that the, the U.S. is being more open to crypto innovation because they don't want that innovation to go elsewhere. So I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, lobbying for this from, from crypto people, talking with regulators, being like, this is going to happen and it might as well happen in the U.S. and not elsewhere. Like if you really start clamping down on this industry, you'll get, you know, really kind of brilliant developers and entrepreneurs go outside of the U.S. to build this. So I think maybe that's that's one way that DeFi can be protected. I, I don't I don't know what's the state of the, you know, ongoing or, you know, pending regulation in the U.S. Um, I'm, I'm one of the staff members of the the French Association for the Development of Crypto Assets. And um, we work closely with the industry here, and you know we we've been following and working with uh, European regulators on regulatory regime that's coming to Europe. And I don't know how much I can talk about this uh, yet, but we we got a draft of the regulation that's coming that will be presented to the Commission shortly, and it does not look good for stable coins uh, in Europe. And um, you know, of course, this is just like a draft that's going to. Uh, you know, be presented to the commission, then it has to go through the entire like legislative process, et cetera. But um, you know, stable coins would, would definitely get a, a, a big hit uh, here in Europe. And if that if that happens, then then it becomes very difficult for you know regulated exchanges to um, to deal with stable coins. You know, one of the one of the things that this could signal, though, however, is um, is that things really go decentralized, right? So then you you basically have more decentralized exchanges, more decentralized platforms, and so like the trading happens there, and then you know, maybe centralized platforms are able to trade in ETH or, you know, some of the layer ones, but m most of the other, the rest of the activity happens on the on decentralized exchanges. Uh, hopefully we can do an episode about that when, when we know a little bit more and we're, when we're able to talk about it more. But. Wow, that's so interesting to hear. So would they, would they regulate kind of centralized exchanges dealing with like offering stable claims? Well, if... if like let's just take a hypothetical here where stable coins or some some sorts some types of stable coins are 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 illegal then then regulated exchanges would not be able to to list them right so if you have like a type of stable coin that's is illegal in the in the EU then the, obviously exchanges would have to be list right yeah so then you would have to go through like say Ether in a regulated exchange in in Europe, and then take that ether to to Uniswap, for example. Yeah. Okay, and then buy through there. Yeah, I, I guess. I mean, yeah, it's kind of early to tell, but. Wow, and do you think people would be like liable for just holding stable coins on their like decentralized wallet? I don't know. I think that's hard to do. Right. Yeah, I think that's really hard to do. But you know, but then yeah, I mean. Projects could also be held liable, right? If you create a stablecoin uh, that is that is illegal in Europe or in any jurisdiction, for that matter, then I think you you can be held liable um, for for issuing that stablecoin and making it or issuing that asset and making it making it available to um, to people in that jurisdiction. But yeah, I mean that's it's still very like early early information that we have yet to really digest. Like we just got this like a couple of days ago, and so we're still like reading through it. Yeah. Right. I wonder how, how they would uh, view that, like, 
Um, so, so say somebody, you know, creates a stable coin and it's not based in, in Europe, but obviously the stable coin is available everywhere in the world. Like, how do you regulate that? It's like, because people in Europe can access it, then yeah. Yeah, that gets that gets tricky then, right? Like it, it gets tricky then. Like who is the issuer? What is their responsibility to those who are holding it? Do they have to do KYC when yeah, it's like it gets really tricky then when you're talking about it at the asset level. I do want to talk about the defiant a little bit before we wrap up. Uh so yeah, tell our listeners, you know, what is the defiant and what is it about and and what can people learn at the defiant? Sure. So, yeah, like I said earlier, I started the Defiant in June last year after seeing all this activity in decentralized finance picking up and not uh, a lot of good coverage around it. So I started it as a daily newsletter. You know, I, I said, I'll just have this medium for communicating all the latest, like most important developments in, in DeFi. And my goal would be just to kind of explain it in simpler terms because everything is so complicated and provide additional analysis um, with it. That's kind of where I started. And I said, I'll I'll try to keep it to a daily newsletter. If not, you know, I'll go to a weekly one. But in the end, it was like more than enough uh, for me to keep on doing the daily. And so, you know, I started doing it just like not not really knowing how I would do it like I had never done something like that it was it was really scary to be putting something out there without the Bloomberg name at the time yeah um like I had always been kind of like protected by that and now it's just like my own name writing without an editor so that was super scary uh but you know after like the first few issues I started getting really good feedback like uh, it started really kind of growing quickly without any marketing other than my own Twitter. <laughs> so uh, that was really exciting to see. And it just like motivated me to, to just uh, keep going. And so I added um, a podcast because I was already doing a weekly interview for, for the Defiant and recording it. So I was like, I might as well just do a podcast with this. And then recently I started a, a YouTube channel. And the idea with the YouTube channel is to bring kind of DeFi to a, a wider audience, just like make it more digestible. Um, because right now the newsletter is is more kind of for people already who already know something about, about DeFi. Like it, it can get very specific at times. So the, the YouTube channel really wants to get at that kind of broader audience. And yeah, it, I've taken on um, a small team of contributors who write for the DeFi uh, very frequently. So it's it's really turning into um, a small media company, and the, my my goal is to grow it from here. Yeah, I get your newsletter. I think I may have listened to one or two of your podcasts. I didn't know about the YouTube channel, and as I was researching this, I like looked up the YouTube channel. And it's like some really good content there, and it's like really well produced and like high high production quality. I think you're working with you're partnering with an, another project to to do a lot of this content, but it's like. It's really well done. Like it's at the, you know, Vox level type content. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing what Robin can do. I mean, this partnership has worked out amazingly. Like uh, Robin from from Harmony came, like he, we, we met because he was shooting a documentary last year. And so he interviewed me for that. And then he came up to me and said, hey, like I, we want to do DeFi content at, at Harmony. So like, what do you feel about partnering up for it? And so basically it's it's like a sponsorship. It's like Harmony is sponsoring my videos for YouTube, but instead of kind of paying me like the sponsorship money they're <laughs> amount, yeah. they're producing the video with, with Robin. Yeah. So it, it's really worked out great. Yeah, it's it's fantastic. It's got, uh, congratulations. I mean, as, as someone who has a small media company uh, and, you know, <laughs> knows about the, the struggles of having a small media company, uh, I think you're doing like really fantastic work. And Thank how you. have you, um, I know, I think you have sponsors on the, on the newsletter uh, and you're also selling like through Substack. I'm also curious, you know, uh, kind of a meta topic here, but you know, what's been your experience with monetizing the content? Yeah. So for, for me, you know, when, when I saw the Defiant really picking up and growing, I realized 
this can be my full-time job. Like I was thinking, should I keep doing this on the side and, and, and do like freelance work? But then I, I, I decided, you know, let this be my, my full-time job. Like this is going to be my business. And so I started with, you know, Substack makes it very easy to add like paid subscriptions to it. So, you know, one day, like late last year, I just decided to turn on <laughs> like paid subscriptions. And my idea is to still kind of have most of my content be free, but to have like group of subscribers receive added value. Mm -hmm. So like some one, one newsletter um, a week has kind of blocked off content that's just for subscribers. They also get like a full transcript of my podcast and they get access to a like subscribers only Discord channel where kind of we chat about what's going on. So, so yeah, that's wor worked out well. And then earlier this year, I started kind of getting emails from, from uh, DeFi companies wanting to sponsor the newsletter. And so I, I saw that as like, okay, th this is like another way to monetize a newsletter. So yeah, I started kind of uh, accepting sponsors for the newsletter. It's helpful to have that um, journalism background because for me, it's just like very much rooted in how I, I think about media, that there needs to be kind of this Chinese wall between sponsors and content. So like, I will never take payment for the content itself in, in the newsletter. When people like want to pay for like content in the newsletter, it's clearly marked and separate from the rest of the content. Like this is a sponsored post and it's written by them. Like I'm not writing it. So, you know, I, I thought about this for a long time. Like, should I take sponsors? Like, is it gonna kind of ruin or like taint the defiant? Um, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm happy with the, the balance so far because I, I obviously have, or I think I have maintained an in like improve the the quality of of the content and, and just like really have kept it separate with with the sponsors and you know it, it's really making this a viable uh, business and i'm i'm just like really happy to be able to do this full time and where would you like to see it in the next say five years where, where you hope to see the defiant well my my big vision for the defiant is for it to become the bloomberg of the open economy so i i want to be kind of trusted place for decentralized finance and yeah just like the open economy in general you know finance DAOs, nfts like all of that and just you know provide quality journalism and content and also like data and information about the space cool well thanks so much for joining me today where can people find you and where would you like to send our listeners to yeah on i'm active on twitter my name on twitter is kami russo uh, C A M I R U S S O, and yeah, you subs you can subscribe to the Defiant at thedefiant.substack.com, and you can find my book on Amazon uh, if you search for the Infinite Machine there. So yeah, it was a great conversation. Really, really happy to to have come on. Thank you. Yeah, and actually, I'm looking. At, you get your book in the background, and someone was uh, someone on Twitter was asking, "What is on the cover of the book?" <laughs> and I think I know the answer, and I think it's a unicorn. But it is. It is. Ah, <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's like a pixelated picture of a rainbow and unicorn. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So the secret's been unveiled. Thanks, Camilla. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.